So what is attachment theory and how can it be used to heal our inner child? Yeah, so attachment theory at its very basic roots is just about those first connections we have as human beings and those first important relationships we have with caregivers, which for most of us are parents or maybe grandparents, other important adults in our lives. But that's where we learn the script of life. We come into the world as blank slates. And so when we have those early experiences, it teaches us about how people are likely to respond to us when we ask for help, when there's a need to be expressed, um, who we are in the world, what we believe about ourselves, whether we even believe we can achieve good outcomes and if we deserve them. And so it's really that beginning um, stages of essentially sculpting the rest of your life. And that's why those experiences carry through to our adulthood so much, uh, so much more um, than maybe, you know, an adult experience that you have. It could be a one-off. You don't kind of integrate it into your worldview you have. Hmm. But those early experiences, they're more easily integrated into what you think is what the world is about and how it works. Because yeah, it sort of like forms our OS, right? Like our operating yeah. system. Exactly. Wow, interesting. Well, I do want to get into the nitty gritty, but your your background is as a forensic neuropsychologist, is it not? Yeah, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist. Wow. So, yeah. so how do you become interested in attachment theory, attachment styles, et cetera? Well, when I was working with my patients, um, and my first book was about how to stop self-sabotage, and I felt like we really got into like, well, where does that come from? Where are the roots? But there's also a deeper level in terms of where where does this kind of self-hindering behavior come from that people fall prone to. And I realized that the deepest level is really attachment. So I'm traditionally trained as a cognitive behavioral therapist. That's very much here and now work. It's about skills. And even though I was trying to help my patients solve their problems in real time, I noticed that it was always going back to the past. You know, why do they approach a problem the way they do now? Um, why do they use certain coping strategies? It's not necessarily about the problem that's in front of them. It's about how they develop those beliefs in the first place. And if we don't address the past, the same kind of problems are gonna keep occurring. So that's where it dawned on me of, well, you know what, you have to go back to the past enough to learn what those roots are and then how to heal so that you don't keep getting into the same traps in the future. Hmm. So interesting. Now, is there like rigorous science regarding these like attachment theory and these various attachment styles because i know that they're pretty popular now in the pop right. in the zeitgeist right in yeah. pop literature yeah but like how much science i guess is there backing this concept yeah it's an excellent question i know that you're all about the science and so am i and i think that maybe there was a part of me that says oh you know attachment is becoming this like pop psychology concept so even i overlooked it for a while but there is actually a really uh, firm foundation of science that led attachment theory to be developed in the first place. And that goes all the way back to the 60s with John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. They were two of the most uh, important attachment theorists. And they actually did do a number of studies with infants and toddlers to look at how they responded to their primary caregiver in an environment that they designed where the caregiver would arrive into a new space with their child and they would play with the child in the room, there's toys around, and then a stranger would come in, the ma mother, usually mother, sometimes it was a father, would talk to the stranger for a couple of minutes, and then the mother or father would leave the room. And they looked at how the child would respond when the parent was no longer there, and then the parent would return, and they also watched how the child responded once the parent returned. And through these studies, and a series of these done with hundreds, if not thousands of infants and toddlers, they learned that people generally are classified into four different attachment styles. Now, I think it, it got into the pop psychology world because people were really thinking about attachment and how it relates to romantic relationships. Mm. So this whole idea of like, okay, you learn to love as a child this way, and then it's going to translate to how you date and how you mate with people. And I think that that's a really limited view of looking at attachment research because really it affects, I mean, you said it was OS. It's our operating system. So it's not just romantic relationships. It's career set, career goals general goal setting, health and wellness goals, all your relationships in life, friendships, collegial, and family. So I think, again, I think it's just kind of that that in that kind of made it fun in the pop world of, oh, let's talk about dating. But it's such a limited view of what attachment really does. So it, it, it basically informs how we attach to, I mean, I guess to, to other things like in our lives, like whether it's our, you know, uh, healthy habits, yeah. unhealthy habits, even 
um, our how we relate to our coworkers, how we relate maybe to our siblings, friends. Exactly right, because that OS is always operating underneath. Wow. And so it it really has to not only do with how we connect with others, but also just how we approach life in general and whether or not we even believe that we can achieve goals. I mean, it's just that simple. Hmm. So yeah. what are the what are the different attachment styles? Yeah, so there's four attachment styles and there's one secure attachment style and three that's called insecure. And they came from this research study that I mentioned earlier that Mary Ainsworth designed. So out of the babies and toddlers she watched, she noticed that there was a group of babies where, of course, when the parent left, they would seem distressed. That's natural. That's a survival instinct. But... Um, they also, there's a recollection of, oh, but my parent, my mom, my dad, they were interacting with this person. So maybe they're not, they're not like an unsafe person. So they wouldn't maybe be so excited to be in the room without their parent and with a stranger. Um, but they would still kind of function. They would still play a little bit and maybe interact with a stranger a little bit. And then when the parent came back, they were excited to see the parent. They weren't upset with the parent, really. They were just happy that their secure parent is back, right? And so that was categorized as secure attachment. And then the three insecure types, they had different types of responses. So when the parent came back, people who were anxiously attached, these babies, were really distraught with their parent. Um, really kind of more clingy than the average child and wouldn't let the parent go and then wouldn't really explore even though the parent was back. The avoidantly attached children, they look like they almost didn't care that the parent was back. It's almost like there's a brief acknowledgement and they just go back to doing what they were doing. And at first, the researchers thought, oh, this is just kind of the way that they're coping with with a separation and maybe they're just not as distressed but actually when they measured the heart rates of these infants and toddlers in a later study they realized that it was amplified so there's kind of like a cover for their distress by pretending not to care wow. but actually they were really stressed out on the inside and then the disorganized attachment which is the last insecure attachment style was the one that was the most difficult to to understand basically they would have varying ways of coping maybe one minute they seem really angry with the parent and the next minute they're clinging to the parent so it was kind of like not one consistent way that they would respond once the parent came back. So those are the three insecure attachment styles. And as you might imagine, it really uh, speaks to how they might deal with conflict or deal with stress in adulthood. There's a lot of similar themes even as they grow up. Wow. And what style of parenting, I guess, would would lead to one developing a, a, an insecure attachment versus a more secure attachment? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of the 80-20 rule, I think, with parenting in that you, there's nobody who's a perfect parent, but like somebody who is going to develop a secure attachment in their child, 80% of the time, they're responsive to their child's needs. They're there emotionally and physically. And generally, there's a consistent way of addressing things that come up with their children. Um, parents who are more likely to create an anxious attachment in their children are parents who maybe look like they have a hard time coping with emotional stress. Hmm. Um, sometimes it's that they're kind of absent-minded one minute, but the next minute they're hovering over their children. Um, sometimes these parents are communicating to the children that there's a lot to be feared in the world, so they may have their own anxieties. So that tends to create a more anxious attachment in their children. With parents who create avoidant children, um, they're usually ones who give their children a lot of responsibilities, even when they're little. Um, gives them the message that you need to take care of your own needs. Don't talk to me about your negative emotions. And sometimes that's cultural, right? Like certain, certain cultures where there's a value of stoicism, like don't complain. Um, and so again, sometimes parents are doing things the best that they can and they still create these styles because the child learns, well, I better not talk about my needs or people aren't going to meet them anyway. And so as a way to still keep their parent around, because as human beings, we can't fend for ourselves until we get older. It's their way of still keeping their parents close, even if they can't get all their needs met. And so it develops into this avoidant style where children and later adults, they're overly independent almost. And then like they never talk about their distress with anybody hmm. else. And then the disorganized um, parent, um, that's a little harder. You know, a lot of times there's some level of trauma that's occurred in the family. And it may not be that the parent themselves were the abuser, although sometimes that happened. Um, it's more that there's a lot of major stress and trauma in the family dynamic, and the parent just looked emotionally dysregulated a lot of the time themselves. And so that kind of creates this sort of not really knowing how to cope and having difficulty regulating as a child too. Wow. It's it was something that you uh, alluded to that, that I never thought of previously was that 
was I, I, I wonder how um, applicable, yeah, these styles are across different cultures. Yeah. You know, like, is the, are these like essentially human universals mm-hmm. or is this like a, 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 a Western kind of concept, you know, where yeah. um, we're basically applying sort of like the Western ethnocentric, you know, view of relationships, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and sort of applying science, you know, to, to those uh, different paradigms? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would say that the need for connection is universal. Just for us as a species, we're a social species. We need to have meaningful connection with others to thrive and to survive at the very basic level. But I do think that, you know, so much of the research, the predominance of attachment research, of course, is done it, it has been done in Western cultures. And so there is an ethnocentric view to an extent of what parenting is most desired. Although you do find that these trends do follow even in the international studies. Mm. And so there are just some caveats. So for example, in countries where um, maybe emotional stoicism is more valued, some Asian countries, for example, um, these attachment styles still all exist, but it's less provoked um, by a parenting style where maybe they're less emotional in general on a day-to-day basis, but it is still provoked by, for example, a parent not being available. Hmm. So maybe it's not so much about the parent always saying, like, let's wear our emotions on our face, but if the parent is not as readily available to the children, it's still going to create an insecure attachment style. Hmm. Is it fair to say that, I mean, it's secure secure attachment that's ultimately desirable right Mm -hmm. and insecure attachment is i guess less less desirable right right so is there a way to because these attachment paradigms seem to be so hardwired right again going back to the os is there a way to um change them yeah right like uh, like as we age Yeah, definitely. So I think that that's also another thing about attachment that pop culture maybe has gotten wrong a bit as they're trying to adopt these ideas and translate them as like, okay, well, you're born with the, I mean, not not you're born, but it's in those early years. So, you know, kind of these are your experiences. They've been cemented. Um, It's your past and you kind of have to just deal with it now. Right. And that's really not it at all. You can actually change your attachment at any age. And even if your primary caregivers, your parents are not available or want to do the work with you at a later time. You can heal your own attachment and then because you have then been been able to turn your attachment style to a more secure one, you're gonna be able to have more positive outcomes in all of these different areas of your life. But I think that generally pop psychology has sort of made it seem like, well, that's your past, so like let's just try to cope with it now. Kind of like let's see how we can manage it as opposed to heal it. You know, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I've always wondered about like the, um the pros and cons of having these sorts of applying these kinds of concrete definitions to um to our our sense of self you know like something that is by definition very fluid ever-changing ephemeral but then we have these you know like if you it's sort of like um astrology in a way you know like you Mm -hmm. you kind of hear that you're from a young age that you you're given certain traits based on your astrological sign which of course has no at least to my knowledge no you know science underpinning it Mm -hmm. and then you carry those definitions with you for the rest of your life right Right. like i'm a gemini i'm i'm supposed to be two-faced or i'm you know supposed to have these like poles in my personality you know Mm -hmm. and uh and i wonder how much of that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy down the road you know, mm-hmm. as we uh, as we cling to these these kinds of these sorts of definitions, you know. Yeah, it's a good point that you brought up about astrology and kind of what you read into. It's like that Barnum effect, right? Where it's like you read something, you're like, "This describes me." And yeah, like, I didn't know that you are you a Gemini because yeah, yeah. I am a Gemini. Are you as well? Yeah. When's your birthday? Yeah. June twelfth. What about oh, you? And, uh, May 29th. Oh, crazy. Okay, yeah. yeah. So you know, uh, sometimes when I read the uh, you know astrological summaries, I'm like, "This sounds like me," but then. <laughs> Sometimes I've read other ones and I'm like, well, it doesn't totally not sound like me either, right? So that's kind of like the idea of the Barnum effect, but then it kind of does carry 
carry through to a lot of how you think about yourself. And like, even though I know that there's no science behind astrology, like I still kind of feel like, oh, the Gemini style speaks to me. And like, yeah. sometimes I interpret my own actions through that lens. And I think that maybe sometimes with attachment styles, it's kind of that similar thing where you're like, well, yeah, but that's what I do because I'm anxiously attached. It's like, well, but it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy because then you kind of recreate those patterns over and over again. Mm. And then our brains are much better at confirming things that already pre-exist in our minds rather than saying, oh, well, this is new information. How could I flex what I actually believe in to make room for this new information so that it actually still is coherent, right? Our brains are just so much easier. You, like they're, they're cognitive misers, our brains, right? Mm. So it's sort of like, well, let me just throw in what I think fits into my existing worldview. Even when that existing worldview is negative, um, hmm. It's just the way that our brains operate unless you really do the work of saying, I'm going to manually change this hmm. automatic drive. Yeah. yeah. So how do we then? How, like, say, we're, say we are insecurely, uh, we're prone to insecure attachment. Yeah. Um, how do we, how do we improve on that? Yeah. And I would say to just be before beginning the work that kind of like self-sabotage. Most people don't sabotage their entire lives. Um, it's like one or two things that keep coming up. It's kind of the same with attachments for most people. Even if you have an insecure attachment style, it doesn't come up in every single area of life. Mm -hmm. There might be certain people in your life that you act securely with, or maybe you're securely attached at work, but not in your romantic relationship. So there's definitely sometimes places that it shows up more than others. And for the most part, when people are stressed, that's where their insecure attachment is showing up. And so in terms of how we start the work of healing, first is just understanding what attachment style you might be prone to. And there could be a combination. 80% of the time I'm secure, but in certain situations, I have anxious attachment. Mm. Like you might learn that about yourself. And so in my book, there's a quiz. It's also my website where people can find out what their attachment style is. And then after that, um, you learn through my book that there's basically a few different self-statements. These are representative of your worldview that is associated with each style. And so for each of the self-statements, there's different healing exercises to manage and to heal those worldviews. And so for one, one example is if you're avoidantly attached, um, you pretty much think that you have to do everything yourself. It's kind of like roll up my sleeves and do everything myself, which it's kind of admirable at a distance, especially when you look at somebody like that, you're like, well, oh, they're so self-sufficient. But again, going back to this idea that all humans need connection, um, there's really a, a way of healing that so that you can allow people who deserve your trust, who you can put some of your burden on as opposed to doing everything yourself, because that then just reinforces this worldview that nobody wants to help you. Right? Mm. So again, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think it's really about learning what parts of those worldviews applies to you and your attachment style, and then doing the exercises that speak to each one. Yeah, you talk about reparenting yourself. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, definitely. So again, you know, no parent is perfect. Um, this is not really about blaming your parents because again, I think most parents probably did the best that they could. Um, and this whole idea of reparenting connects with the, uh, the concept of inner child, which I know has also become kind of more part of the pop vocabulary. And this idea of reparenting is giving your inner child that, that metaphorical little you that maybe has unmet needs from childhood, believes certain things that might be negative about themselves and the world, um, being able to teach it lessons and give it coping um, that you now as the adult self, because you have more proficiencies, you're more in control of your life, you have more awareness, you have more tools, um, and you can give your inner child what it needed from the past that it still carries with it today because it's still part of your worldview, that insecure attachment style. So reparenting work is really as simple as, you know, understanding your inner child and what those biggest needs were from childhood. And then a little bit at a time, giving your child the agency and helping your child to meet their needs. Hmm. Do men and women uh, present differently based on their, based on their attachment styles? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I do think that expressively it shows up differently um, there are some studies about gender differences of how they show up so for example anxious attachment um, something that is associated with anxious attachment is codependency so they tend to want to like rescue everybody in their lives and they put other people's needs before themselves but we find that in some of the studies females especially they want to essentially rescue not only their romantic partners but essentially everybody else in their life it's like 
everybody, come all, like, you know, everybody, we're just going to roll up our sleeves and take care of everybody. Um, and they themselves get burnt out because there's never time for their own needs. Whereas in men, some of the studies have shown that they'll usually just pick like one or two pivotal people where they'll do that with. So there may be some codependency, but it's not like attached to everybody in their inner circle. It's like one or two. Um, and then they focus all of their attention on that. Also, some of the codependency can show up even in the way that they approach work. So instead of really focusing on their job and like actually reaching the goals, they're really attuned to what everybody else is saying about their work. And that, of course, then interferes in you actually being able to do your job because there's just so much noise and you can't please everyone. Hmm. Is there a consequence to growing up um, in single parent households? Yeah, I think that it can work both ways. Sometimes in single parent households, the parent is almost like extra attentive because they're trying to make up for the lack of a second parent or somebody else being around. But I also think that oftentimes what I've learned from studies about single parents and also just what I see clinically is that they feel overwhelmed a lot. You know, they want to do everything, but they can't do it all. And so sometimes that does create an insecure attachment in their children because they learned certain coping strategies from watching their parent. So if the parent looks overwhelmed all the time, the child is going to be prone to feeling like I always have to watch my back. There's going to be a little bit more of a hypervigilance. And then it is like the child's constantly in fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And we know that that puts them at greater risk for physical and mental health ailments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big problem. We had a, a brilliant... Uh PhD on the show, I forget what his PhD was in, but he, Warren Farrell, he uh, wrote a mm. fantastic book called The Boy Crisis. Mm. And the crux of the episode, we focused, I think, primarily on the consequences of being a, a boy growing up in a fatherless home and, um, mm. and how that, you know, how that, if you don't have a strong male role model, you know, as a boy growing up, yeah. um, it really sets you off down a, a pretty pretty it can potentially set you off down a pretty unfortunate path antisocial yeah. behavior right you know bullying and things like that um, yeah that makes a lot of sense to me especially because you kind of need something to ref reflect your own behavior off of right so if there isn't a strong male figure in your life it's hard to know what your own templates are for behaviors and for how to think about things or even how to relate to other people mm. um, in a way that's pro-social and meaningful. So that doesn't surprise me, but it is such obviously a common issue that can happen. And maybe you guys even got into like talking about ways you can ameliorate that. Like, okay, if there is no father, then like make sure they have some other strong male model. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, Boy Scouts or like exactly. um, team, team, you know, team sports, obviously it's like a, yes, you know, and a self-esteem builder. Self-esteem builder. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how girls, we didn't really get into that, but how girls, you know, growing up in single parent households do, you know, without a father figure around. Yeah. There is some research that shows that they have a more difficult time holding healthy boundaries in relationships just overall, like all relationships, but especially in relationships with males. So if they're heterosexual and they get into partnerships with men, they don't really know the script of like what's acceptable and what's not. Hmm. And so that can cause some difficulty. They could even sometimes, you know, at the worst of it, get into abusive relationships and have a harder time getting out because they didn't have a norm to follow of, well, what does that even look like? What's a healthy, healthy dynamic between a woman and a man? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And attachment has a lot to do with that, too. I mean, again, your relationships with your parents, how you see them relate to each other, all of that goes into your operating system. Hmm. And so your belief systems about, you know, well, is this person going to leave me? If I don't hold on for dear life, maybe they will. I mean, sometimes they learn that from parents, right? So again, somebody with an anxious attachment style, it may be that, you know, they watched infidelities between their parents, like multiple breakups between their parents and then trying to get back together. Um, and all of that can create this feeling of, well, if I don't hold on to somebody or behave in a certain way all the time, then I'm going to lose their support. And hmm. that's what leads to that codependency I was talking about earlier and that people pleasing aspect and always watching for people's reactions instead of focusing on what you really want for yourself. Yeah. So interesting. So aside from picking up your fantastic book, The New Rules of Attachment, I mean, what are somebody who's listening to this, who's struggled in relationship, uh, thinks that perhaps they have a, a more insecure, um, or they've had a more insecure attachment style, um, in their romantic endeavors, what's the first place that they should start to begin to, you know, the, the, this journey of self-inquiry and ultimately um, correction? Yeah. So um, one of the first exercises that I have people do in the book is actually a reflective exercise on what their self-concept is made up of. And so 
we kind of get the idea of self-esteem, we kind of get the idea of sense of self, but most of us have not asked that question really explicitly. Like if I was given one minute to define who I am, like how, what would, what would that look like? What goes into what I define myself with? And usually what you find after that exercise is that there's, there's some blind spots maybe, or there's some things that are missing from your self-concept to make it like truly holistic and balanced. Some people, when I have them do this exercise, most of the things that they name as part of themselves are just personality traits and achievements, whereas other people really name their roles um, in reflection with other people or maybe even aspirational traits, but they don't really think that they actually have those traits. And that actually tells you a lot about one, your attachment style, but two, also how it impacts your self-concept. And that's actually the biggest part of my book. This, like one of my primary theses is that, you know, we don't realize that attachment actually has so much to do with the development of our sense of self. Hmm. And so really understanding that is the first step and then finding ways to nurture different aspects of yourself is really important because what we find happens when people suffer from low self-esteem after a big stress or a crisis is that perhaps their sense of self was too invested in one area of life. Mm. Maybe it was too invested on career achievements or too invested in how their relationship is going in the romantic realm. And if you can find a way to balance out your self-concept and be able to nurture all of those different parts, when you have a disappointment in one area, it's so much easier to then keep yourself intact and to keep your self-esteem intact, which of course is important because if you start to lose belief in yourself and feel like you can't do things or affect positive outcomes, that's a cascade of thoughts and feelings and behaviors that essentially create that self-fulfilling prophecy we talked about. Probably leads to like catastrophizing. Oh, absolutely. Like this is it for me, you know? And of course, if that's what you think, it's going to create yeah. certain emotions and actions that make that your reality. Mm. And so that's one of the biggest um, pieces of... Um, I think, you know, really important piece of information for people to know is just like how much it connects to self, but also how much you can still change your sense of self and to balance out those different aspects. I also have people do a visioning exercise where they think ahead to the future. And I ask them this miracle question, which is something that is common in certain aspects of psychological um, therapy and healing, where you ask them, you know, if you woke up the next day and all of the things that you were struggling with went away, what would your life look like? And you really ask them to be very visceral in that visualization. I have people write down like the details, like I wake up and this is what's happening with my day and here's how I'm feeling and here's what I'm thinking. And then we really line that up with like their current life now and how they feel about their life currently, um, their level of satisfaction with life, you know, what areas they think are still staking points. And oftentimes when somebody has insecure attachment, those two visions are very far apart. Hmm. So then we start to do some exercises on how we can bring those visions closer together so you can get closer to your ideal life and your ideal self. Wow. And that's, but that's an exercise that anybody can do at home, right? Yeah. So visualize like what a perfect day, if all of your problems went away tomorrow Yeah. and, um, and tomorrow was like going to be a perfect day for you to write down as explicitly and specifically as possible, like what that day might look like. Right. Exactly. Wow. Super yeah. interesting. Yeah. And like different aspects of your life. Right. So you can reflect on how your friendships would go, how your job would be. Um, what would it be like with your partner? You know, what would it be like when you went to work out or exercise? I mean, I ask people to get really, really detailed with it. And it is important to have that level of detail because then it becomes really concrete to you. Hmm. And then you can really measure that against what you're seeing now and then talk about like, how do we bring those discrepancies closer together so that it doesn't feel like there's this huge divide and you're never going to get there. Yeah. yeah. What if you don't have a partner? Is there any value? Because I've, you know, seen a therapist, uh, for much of the past two years mm -hmm. and um but even prior to that like something that um for example friends of mine would always tell me to do that that supposedly is is helpful is to write as specifically as you can the traits of the uh partner that you hope to manifest mm -hmm. like write that down as specifically as possible so interesting yeah i mean if you don't have a partner i think that that could be part of your envisioning of a perfect day if you desire a partner. But there's also some people who are like, that's not really something I need right now and I don't necessarily see myself needing in the future and mm. it's okay to vision it without them too, mm. you know? I think it's really just meeting yourself where you're at. You know, not everybody at every phase of life even wants those things. Um, obviously, I think our 
mainstream culture would say we all should want those things. I don't think that that's true. I think that connection can happen on any level. And so that's the other thing about attachment theory, right? Again, in pop psychology, people are like, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm not dating right now and like I don't have a partner. And I'm like, well, but it does affect you because it affects your sense of self and how you vision your life. I would just say that for people who are saying, well, maybe I don't need a romantic partner. One good question to ask though is like, do you feel like you don't need a partner and that's just like where you're at? Or do you feel like you don't need a partner because you think that if you had one, they disappoint you anyway and it's not worth the investment? I mean, it's just good to know that about yourself. Like, is it me denying myself of that opportunity because I'm afraid of what's there? Or I truly just don't see that as being important in my life. Hmm. And I feel like in my life in the past, I've been of both minds. Like there's been times where I'm like, I'm happy right now being single. And then there's been times where I'm like, you know, I think I'm saying that I'm happy, but maybe I want a partner, but I just don't think I'm going to find the right person. You know, so I think you just have to be real with yourself when you're doing these assessments for sure. Yeah, the realer the better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody has to see your notes, right? I mean, that's the best part about doing this work sometimes on your own is like, okay, well, like, I don't have to tell anybody about it. It's just like for me. So, like, you're going to get more out of it if you're being honest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, think a, a, I think the last iPhone update, there's like a new Apple journaling app. What? Really? Yeah. Oh, man. So now you can just journal in your I know, because well, all this data is coming out now, I guess maybe you can speak to it, I don't know, showing us how, how beneficial journaling can be. It really is. From a mental health standpoint. Yeah, even if you're skeptical, because it just organizes your thoughts. Um, mm. And there's something to writing it versus, I mean, I think it's still okay to like journal, you know, again on a phone, but um, there's an added benefit of writing. And the reason is we type so much faster, like, Obviously, we're so on our devices all the time now. I type so fast, and I think that it's just training on <laughs> iPhones, maybe, and of course, laptops. Um, but it doesn't really work to organize your thoughts quite as well because you can type like at lightning speeds. Whereas if you're writing, it's kind of like a self limiting, like how fast can you really write and still have it be legible? And that actually helps you to process what's going on a lot better. Hmm. And so people find that it's really helpful just for not only organizing their thoughts, but like being more mindful and like slowing down and understanding what their thoughts might mean. And also when you put something on the page, it doesn't feel as overwhelming and as amorphous. Yeah. I mean, you can even see the effect of something like that with to-do lists. Like sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I have so much to do. I don't even want to write a to-do list because I'm scared <laughs> like what that's going to look like. But I always feel better if I finally sit down and write it because I'm like, oh, okay. Like in my mind, it felt like a hundred things, but it's like 12. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it actually does help, I think, um, to really take your time to like process your thoughts that way and not only to get to know yourself better, but you also see where the trouble points are and then you can mm. come up with a plan to resolve them and also it tells you what you can change and what you can't so sometimes we get really worried and stressed out about things and it's out of our control mm. so it's almost like writing that down can be okay but i can't change this so let me put that aside and like just think about the things that i can actually change and yeah. that's helpful too 100 percent. it's kind of like i've used a metaphor in the past where it's kind of like um you know the value that therapy talk therapy and even journaling provides it's sort of like if you were to think about what it might take to reorganize, everybody has a junk drawer mm -hmm. in their kitchens. You know, yeah. I, I certainly have one. Yep. If you tried to organize your junk drawer without taking everything out of it first, yes. it would be a lot more difficult to do, you know? Because right. everything's like in the drawer. Like everything's like all over the place and in the drawer. Yeah. If you really want to organize the junk drawer, I think it probably is beneficial to take everything out of the junk drawer first. Empty the drunk junk drawer. Right. So that you can then put things in their right place. But uh, you got to take everything out first. And so right. like talk therapy or journaling, it's like essentially by putting something either by verbalizing what it is that you're going through internally, which can sometimes like, you know, your mind can sometimes feel like a junk drawer. I know the mind right. sometimes can, you know, right. by verbalizing or by writing it down onto, you know, onto your phone or the written page. It's essentially in a way like taking things out first. And then you realize it's not all that scary, you know, right. putting it all, putting everything back exactly into its right place that's such a great analogy and i think that every single like organizational expert would agree with you with physical items but oh. it's such a great application to think about that about your mental items like your brain is just like holding on to all this junk and also it's very hard because then it's clouding your brain's ability to attend to the things that it needs to right it's like there's all of this jumbled mess and you're still trying to focus on something i mean that's why anxiety and stress can really impact our ability to be productive because hmm. you literally have like two lines of thinking happening at the same time and our brains don't multitask it's just switching back and forth quickly and it also drains our energy so like the more 
organize your actual mental spaces, the better you're going to be at like attacking all the goals that you have in your life too. Absolutely. And everybody has a junk drawer. You know, oh, old yeah. re- old rela- baggage from old relationships. Yeah. Work trauma, family trauma. Yep. Uh, you know, so social media drama, like it's just yeah. like, you <laughs> yeah, know, <laughs> it's true. like today in 2024, yeah, everybody has a junk drawer. So it's, it's really helpful to be able to, um, to know how to best organize a junk drawer, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, I, I really like that analogy because I think everybody can relate to that and you can think about it in physical space. So then if you think about how to apply that mentally, it's such a great game changer because, you know, it's like, okay, take the time to like reorganize your junk drawer in your mind and then you're going to have better outcomes. And that's really just the bottom. Absolutely. Do you talk at all about the role of uh, like physical health and fitness? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So again, attachment styles really play a role in how you attack your physical goals, your physical health goals, whether or not you even deserve to be good to yourself and to take care of yourself and whether or not you're going to meet those goals in the first place. And generally, individuals who have insecure attachment, they're going to have some trouble with goal setting and also goal attainment. In avoidant attachment, one of the common pitfalls is actually that they like overly schedule themselves and they become overly ambitious about their physical goals to the point of exhaustion. It's like at the exclusion of other things that could balance their life out more and create more joy for them. For people who have insecure attachment that's of the anxious um, type, they tend to have more difficulty setting goals where they're doing it independently. It's like they have to have somebody doing it with them or somebody telling them that they're doing a good job. Otherwise, they kind of lose confidence in themselves. And then with people who are disorganized attached, um, it's almost like they're so much in their survival mindset most of the time that they don't even get to those higher levels of actualization than when it comes to physical health. It's just like, how do I survive today? How do I get through today? So when you're approaching any kind of physical health goals from that mindset, like you're not really thinking long term. Hmm. You're kind of just thinking about how do I get through today? So they're more prone to, for example, like eating junk food, even though they know that they should eat healthier for their benefit, both short term and long term. They're just not really visioning things on a long term basis. They're like, I just want to get through like this minute. Hmm. So what does your research say then about about setting and ultimately keeping healthy habits? Yeah. So a big part of this, other than some of the visioning exercises we talked about earlier, is really finding a place for self-compassion. I think that when people have insecure attachment, they're especially prone to having very little compassion for themselves, whether they're blaming themselves or um, feeling like they don't deserve good things to happen to them. Um, There's just a a lack of caring for yourself in the same way that people with secure attachment usually do. And so self-compassion work is, is so important for one's mental health, because if you can't be compassionate toward yourself, then there's not really the next level. And a lot of times it actually shows up in you not being compassionate with others. And so they may not recognize that that's actually a sign of lack of self-compassion. But when you judge other people harshly, it's because there's an internal script in your mind Hmm. that if I were to do this, I wouldn't forgive myself. You know, Hmm. that's kind of what's going on when you judge somebody else. And so um, I have a number of different exercises about self-compassion work, but one that's really powerful is called the mirror, um, the mirror work exercise. So this is like the first step of it is literally just to like look in a mirror and just look at your own self-reflection and seeing how long you're able to do that before you're so uncomfortable with it that you start looking away and most of the people that I've done this with in my practice like after like two or three minutes they're like I can't do it anymore like and that's actually just it just tells you so much about how much self-acceptance you have because people will start to like zone in on like maybe their flaws or like they start to have like really negative thoughts or they just start feeling uncomfortable without being able to label what they're thinking but all of that is different manifestations of a lack of self-acceptance so like one part of this is just to like train yourself with mirror works that like You can look at yourself for like three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, and then you add self-affirmations to it as a second step. So it doesn't have to be multiple self-affirmations. Sometimes I see people's journals and they have like 20 self-affirmations for the day. I'm like, how do you hold that all in your brain? Like, that's too many. Let's find one that you really want to work on today. And then like, that's the one that, that's the theme that you're going to hold for the rest of the day. So for mirror work sessions, it's just one self-affirmation and like saying it to yourself. What might that sound like? So it could be like, Um, I deserve good things. It could be, I'm going to be able to solve my problems. It's okay to make mistakes. You know, it can be something so minor, like, you know, I'm going to forgive myself for the fight that I had with my mom last night, right? It's just one thing at a time, but not so many. 
and then really being able to hold your gaze in the mirror and say that to yourself and like feel like it's resonating and sometimes people will feel like they're defended and there's a block and like they're not able to talk to themselves that way but that's also a form of reparenting therapy of like it's almost like you looking at your wounded self or a younger self or your inner child and saying it's okay Hmm. um and there is a lot of research um that dates back to um dr ellis and like a lot of work around that time where it's like you know self-compassion is the biggest step to doing self-development work that's going to last otherwise you just can't hold on to any concept um for longer than just the thing that's ahead of you because it's going to keep coming up anytime something goes haywire you don't reach your goal you're going to beat yourself up thinking that's motivating you but everybody has worth no matter what happened no matter what their mistakes are every human being has worth just by being and that's a really hard concept for a lot of people to hold on to and especially people who i think are go-getters because they almost feel like they equate their value with their achievements Mm. yeah especially and also today we live in a world that seems to encourage a victim like mindset yeah you know which is ultimately i think it's i mean maybe there's like a short term uh benefit or not not benefit but like uh mm-hmm. it's, it's probably like relieving in the short term right. to feel like oh this was all done to me mm-hmm. but it's ultimately that 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 is ultimately such a, a a disempowering message exactly that's you know that's really what my book talks about a lot of because you know again in pop psychology version of attachment it's like well your parents did this to you right Um, but what does that really do beyond just saying, Hey, my parents, maybe one, were not perfect people. And maybe sometimes in the worst forms, they were even abusive. What does that really do though, about how you can change your life now? It doesn't do anything because you're just in this passive state where it's like something was done to me. Like you were saying, it's disempowering. And also when you have anger, that's unprocessed. It only holds back your own life. It doesn't hold back anyone else's life because even the person that you're angry at, aside from maybe you yelling at them every once in a while, because you're angry with them they're moving on with their day. Mm-hmm. But you're the one who's sitting in that anger. And there's a lot of research that shows that anger has negative physical and mental health manifestations. Like what? Elevating your cortisol, elevating your um, heart, uh, your blood pressure, your heart rate. And if your heart rate is amplified through most of the day, again, that fight or flight comes back. Your body believes that it's in danger. Wow. So your mind can't even focus on things that will actually help you to self-actualize or the bigger goals of life. And they're also more prone, people who have chronic anger are more prone to chronic illnesses of different types, obesity, because again, of the stress hormones and what that does to your body. And so there's a lot of concrete effects of what anger does when you can't let it go. So holding on to anger can wreck your health. It can totally wreck your health. So like you said, in the beginning, it might feel like, ooh, it's powerful, like, ooh, like I'm angry. But beyond like the first like feelings of, catharsis maybe it doesn't actually help you to hold on to it and so this idea of really saying like i'm going to take control of this yes some bad things happened in the past but like what can i do about it now you have to be able to believe that you have agency so again with with research what we see is that when people feel like they have less locus of control so believing that outcomes are ultimately in their hands they don't follow the health advice of their doctors and other professionals because they're like, well, what's, it's not going to do anything for me anyway. It's not going to work out for me anyway. So if you have those beliefs, you're less likely to actually do the things that are going to help you to be healthy. Hmm. Would you say it's true that everybody has some form of trauma? Yeah, I do. I think that. And I think that obviously sometimes in, again, pop psychology, people will say micro versus macro traumas. I yeah, mean, or like big T versus little T. Yeah, for... yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if that's so important, but I would say that probably, I mean, as we get older, especially like everyone has some form of baggage, like you were mentioning earlier. Everybody has something that happened to them that they wish didn't happen. And whether or not you want to call it a trauma, it's certainly a major stressor. And you can't live life without a couple of dents, right? I mean, it's just like, you're going to have some dents. Some dents are bigger, some dents are smaller. But it's going to work its way into your operating script unless you process it and heal from it. And so I think sometimes it's just worked its way into someone's script and like they never bothered to look at it further or to change it. And it can be hard with really severe traumas because when you look at it, um, it's very scary, right? Mm. Like I don't want to have to relive that. But you don't necessarily have to relive a past trauma to get past it. And so one of the exercises I talk about in my book is a form of narrative therapy where you rewrite your narrative. So again, kind of going back to thinking about something bad that happened to you, seeing yourself as a victim, that's very disempowering. But what if you reflected back on that and you thought of, well, how could this be interpreted differently? Or like, what could I have done differently in the time that could have helped me to move through this situation? So it's almost like rewriting a story of your past, but in a way that generates more positive feelings about your ability to control 
other things that might happen in the future. Wow. Are there any case studies you can share? Like people who've like yeah. dramatically like done 180s, changed their lives based on based on your work? Yeah. So there's a patient that I treated who was 62 when I saw her. So again, when people are like, I can't change my attachment style when I'm older, it's definitely not true. But she has been through so many traumas, multiple traumas. I mean, physical, sexual abuse, all from childhood, from different individuals. Um, and, and we do find that sometimes when people have been sexually traumatized, it's usually something that can happen again. There's different reasons for it, um, but some of it is just, you know, for the person who has been through it, the the understanding of boundaries is just different. Most of the times it's actually from people they know intimately, like a romantic partner or a friend. And because of what happened to them in the past, like they don't know how to see the warning signs the way that maybe somebody else would. And so then they end up putting themselves in these same situations inadvertently. You know, it's obviously not their fault, but it's just like they didn't know how to actually say this is a red flag or this is not. So when I first started working with her, she was so dysregulated. She was lashing out at everybody. Again, trauma can show up as anger. It's a form of self-protection. Um, it's a, a symptom of PTSD. And so that was essentially how she was um, for probably the first month or two that we were working together. And then through time, like we did all these different versions of these exercises. And you know, we talked about attachment and how that affected her because a lot of her abuse happened in these really younger years. And then how it showed up in her life, even with her own parenting, with her own children, like there was some kind of intergenerational trauma that got passed on um, in terms of her not really being available for her children at times because she was so emotionally distressed herself. So we did different versions of the narrative therapy. We also did this exercise called empty chair, which is super, really, really interesting. Essentially, you have two chairs in the room and she really wanted to talk to her father because her father was one of her abusers and her father's no longer in this world he had passed away 15 years ago so empty chair exercise is essentially you imagine yourself having a conversation with this person that you have conflict with and that you didn't get to process what happened and so you literally take turns being in each chair and when you're in each chair you're manifesting um, the thoughts and the feelings of perhaps that person and so she basically did a lot of empty chair work um, related to her father and like how he could abuse her and like of course like it's really just about processing something when somebody can't be there to do the work with you. We also did shadow work. Shadow work was really interesting because it's about seeing the parts of yourself that you're hiding because you think the world is not going to accept you for it. Hmm. And these are like the, the lesser known but yet evidence-based strategies that I didn't get to go into in my first book. My first book was really about cognitive behavioral strategies that are more skills-based. But this is more like deeper strategies to like really understand your your underlying roots and like your psyche at a deeper level. You know, I kind of talk about it like as an iceberg where, you know, above the water, you see like the tiny little part of the iceberg, but underneath there's all of this other stuff that's unprocessed. And so this book is really about getting to like more of the deeper roots that are such a big and expansive part of your mind. Wow. And so we did a lot of this work over maybe like six or seven months. And she made... I mean, dramatic, dramatic um, improvements. Like her relationships with her children changed because she was no longer seeing them as like more people to blame. Like she understood her role as a parent and that she made mistakes, but she forgave herself for it. And she's like, how can I change my relationship with them now? Even though they're adult children, it's not too late to heal that. Um, she started to take care of her own needs more. So instead of lashing out at other people, she's like, okay, well, you're angry today. Like, what can I do for that part of myself that's angry? And so she just took more control of the process. And she just was having like much less temper outbursts. She had better relationships with her children. And then she got to a point where she's like, okay, I'm ready to try dating again. She was single for over 20 years after divorcing her husband. She's just like, no one's going to ever be able to like, yeah this way no one can hurt me right but she got to a point where she's like i'm gonna try dating again and that was really big for her because there was a certain sense of openness and trust that she could have about others that she wasn't able to have for a lot of her life that's amazing yeah she was a great patient like at the end she was like hello like she was like so sweet and like so kind but like in the beginning she was angry all the time angry at me angry at anybody else who was in her life who was trying to help i mean wow. it was really yeah she like screamed at me multiple times during the first therapy sessions damn so yeah it was really <clears throat> interesting what was it called empty chair therapy or yeah, empty, empty chair? chair technique technique yeah i was getting, I was getting goosebumps things. when you were talking it just sent, that sounds like the most yeah. powerful is that the kind of thing that you recommend people do like on their own or is it yeah it seems 
powerful. But yeah. if that's something that people could do at home, I mean, yeah, I mean, I give like an, an instruction like of how to try to do it on your own. But obviously, if it gets too overwhelming, it's great to bring in a professional. But mm. I did provide a version of it that you can do on your own. It's also great for all kinds of things. So like, it's good for processing, you know, undealt with issues with anyone whether they're living or they're not here anymore. It's a way to even role play like what you might say to somebody um, when they show up and you finally have that conversation. It's a way to have compassion for somebody else and yourself because it's like, oh, put myself in their shoes. Like what might they have meant by this or what might they say to me? Um, and also it's it's a great way to just, you know, like brainstorm different things, even just with yourself. It's like, okay, there's two parts of my mind that are fighting each other. There's a the part that says like, I really should go for this one goal and the other part that says, don't do it. You can even do the empty chair like that. Like, okay, this is like version A of Judy and version B of Judy. And like, what would they say to each other to try to resolve like whether or not I should take this on or not? So there's like a lot of cool applications with empty chair. And yeah, it is super powerful. Like people have cried. Like it's just wow. a really like emotional releasing type of technique. Wow. And that's, I mean, that's discussed in the meta, in the, you know, psychology literature, like as a. Yeah. Wow. But it's also one of those that like people just don't mind as much. You know, I think that. Again, the low hanging fruits, um, especially in the last few decades, have been cognitive behavioral therapy and like related applications. It's like, ah, concrete skills that you can train. And of course, there's so much value to that. And I'm still at, you know, I think at my core, like I still love those techniques and I see how much they can help. But I think some of these other techniques that we've been talking about today, it's kind of that next level of like, okay, I've learned the skills, but like, how do I not have this be a trigger in the future like how do i like make sure this pattern doesn't keep happening hmm. and that's where this empty chair technique the mirror work like all those things that we've been talking about that's the next level and i don't think it's discussed as much especially not in the pop psychology literature and that's why i felt like it was so important to put that in my book because i see how much it heals attachments and also just helps people function better in life wow I mean, I feel like a lot of people would think that they might seem like a crazy person talking to an empty chair, but we have right. a neuropsychologist here saying you're not. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's okay. And yeah. we always talk to ourselves anyway, so you might as well manifest it in a chair exercise as opposed to just having it in your brain. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's so cool. And I'm so happy for that patient of yours. Yeah, she's doing well. Wow. Amazing. Anything surprise you over the course of writing the book? Yeah, uh, definitely. So what was really interesting is as I was writing the book and I was like trying to piece this all together, I think that there's definitely a common idea that disorganized attachment is just like the most messed up insecure attachment style. And anybody who labeled themselves as that, again, as we were saying, that self-fulfilling prophecy, like, well, there's no help for me, you know? And as I was writing the book, I just noticed like, how much disorganized attachment was really misunderstood in the literature. I mean, supposedly 20 to 25% of people have this attachment style and they've just been basically thrown every label in the book that's negative. It's like, oh, these are the people who tend to have borderline personality. Um, these are the people who tend to have like really major mental health concerns. And like maybe to an extent there's some correlation, but it is really not what people think. And Sometimes people will say, well, if I have disorganized attachment, then my whole life is just messed up. And it's just, it's not true, you know? Um, so I felt like that was a surprise as I was putting this whole program together and reflective of, you know, what I know from the research and what I know from my clinical work. And it's like, no, there's definitely hope for these people. And it's completely misunderstood. But that kind of stereotype does come back to bite you. You know, people who think that they're disorganized attached, they tend to be much more hopeless about their future than the other insecure attachment styles. Hmm. What are the other, what are the proportions of people who are insecure attached versus secure attached? Yeah, so supposedly it's like 75% of people are insecure attached in some wow. way. So most 25. people are insecure. Yeah, at least at or some point. Or prone to insecure prone attachment. Prone to it, exactly, yeah. during points of stress or maybe in certain situations of life. It's important, I've, I've like, uh, caught myself you know because i think it's like it's probably not very helpful to think of yourself as an attachment style but rather mm -hmm. your likely or your 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 likelihood to be prone to a certain yeah. attachment style yeah it's definitely less like there's like a less of a feeling of judgment but it's more like oh i'm prone to react in this way or right. like, i'm prone to maybe this characteristic like i know myself i'm prone to being impatient sometimes you know like yeah it's more like that you know instead of thinking of it as like oh there's this attachment style and it's like the label and it's the end all like it's not right but all of us are prone to something when we're stressed mm. and i think that um certainly i 
I, you know, I've talked about this before and I like, I don't think I mentioned it explicitly in my book, but I think that like when I'm under stress, I am prone to like some of the more avoidant attached coping styles and that like, I just want to like do it all by myself and I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I just like, I get really quiet and I just like go away. Um, whereas some people, um, you know, they're more prone to like reach out in a really big way or like cling to people for support. Um, when I'm really stressed, I like just don't talk to my friends, you mm, know? Yeah. And that's when they know like, oh, are you, is everything okay? Because you haven't called us in two mm. weeks, you know, and that's atypical. And it's really interesting that, you know, you know, when people reflect on that, probably most of us will say, yeah, maybe there's like a trait that sneaks in there when we're under stress. And that's kind of how you know that what your proneness can be sometimes. Yeah, but it's good to use language that doesn't like define you as a trait that can come or right. go. You know, it's right. like rather than saying I am depressed, I have depression. Exactly. I have depression today. I might, I ho hopefully won't have it tomorrow. Exactly. Rather than saying like I am obese, or I am overweight, maybe, I don't know, I don't know any, if there's any data on this, but maybe it's more helpful, more productive to say, I have obesity, yeah. I have overweight. You know? Yeah, it definitely is more helpful. I mean, there's a lot of research on that, even with our thoughts, right? You know, our thoughts could say, well, I'm a loser, or like, I hate myself. And all of that just feels so true, like it defines us. But if you can say, I'm having a thought that, you know, I'm a loser. I'm having a thought that I'm not gonna reach my goal there's something that takes the air out of that first thought, right? Mm. It's like, oh, it's just a thought that I'm having. It's not me, right? But that's the problem with negative shorthands in our minds. It's like, happens so quickly that you just take it as an automatic truth. And it's the same thing with attachment styles. Like, you don't have to be defined by them. They're also not um, inflexible, mm. you know? We all, even people who predominantly act in a quote-unquote insecure attachment style way, there's still moments where they're securely attached in their behaviors and in their yeah. thinking. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry about that. Man, so <laughs> true. So interesting. Well, people should definitely go and pick up your book. I had a blast talking to you. I learned a ton. This was so fun. Thank you so much. It's so great to reconnect with you after four years. Thank I you know. so much for having me on the podcast. And <laughs> yeah, for all your great insights. I love talking to you and you just like always make sense of these complicated concepts and a more you know, feasible way for people to understand and really implement in their life. So I thank you for that. Oh, thanks. Judy means a lot coming thank from you. you. Where I've got one last question for you, but before we get to that, where can people connect with you on social media and where can they pick up your book? Okay, so you can connect with me on social media at Dr. Judy Ho. Um, I'm across all platforms. My primary one is Instagram. You can also find me at drjudyho.com. I have regular giveaways and free quizzes and resources and exercises from the book and also from my first book on my website. Dope. Last question, I guess, as everybody on the show, what does living a genius life mean to you? Ah, uh, living a genius life for me means always self-reflecting and like not giving up on self-development. There's always time to improve and make something better for yourself. I love that, not giving up. Not giving up, yeah, it's never, it's never too late. It's never too late, yeah. amen. Well, thanks for coming in. Hey, if you liked that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.